Okay, so I think we should make a, a start. Welcome everyone to uh, the Law School here at King's College London. My name is Otavio Ferraz. I'm a professor of human rights law here and also the director of the Transnational Law Institute, which is one of the co-organizers of this event together with Brazil Matters. It is a great, great pleasure for me to uh, have this book launch uh, here uh, today. Uh, at the Transnational Law Institute, we have three main areas of research. One is democracy and human rights, which is very uh, fitting like to, to the event uh, today, transnational environmental law and transnational health. Uh, and I, I, would, I would like to start saying that there is a bit of serendipity in, in the event uh, today. I've just finished reading another great book uh, by Ana Maria Gonçalves, Um Defeito de Cor, A Color Defect, about uh, slavery in, in Brazil in the uh, 19th century. And she talks about serendipity there, saying that uh, serendipity is when you find something which you weren't looking for, but you must be already prepared somehow, otherwise you miss what is passing right in front uh, of you. And... Uh, Jen is the third member of this amazing family uh, uh, that I meet, like serendipitously. I first met uh, Ali last year in July when we were launching a documentary we co-produced here on police violence in the favelas of Rio de Janeiro, the communities there, uh, through a common friend of ours, Patrick Granja. And since then, I've been following uh, Brazil Matters uh, events and all the great work she's been doing with Brazil Matters. Uh, but then I went to the Amazon in, in November and on, on a, a project on environmental laws and indigenous people's human rights, in particular the Munduruku people there. And I went to an event in the uh, Federal University of West uh, of Pará, UFOPA, and then I met Bruna uh, Rocha, and, but until a few weeks ago, I didn't know they were sisters. Uh, I, I, I only found that out when I went to another event of Brazil Matters about indigenous people's rights again. And Jen, uh, we were talking, and I, I said that one of my research interests alongside democracy and human rights was environmental laws and the Amazon and the Munduruku. And then she said, oh, you must know my daughter then. And I said, well, yeah, I know, uh, Ali. No, 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 the other one who is in Pará. So, I know three people now uh, of this um, amazing family through uh, a bit of serendipity. And it's, it's very uh, fitting, again, that we do this event here today, be not only because one of the projects we have, uh, one of the areas we have is democracy and human rights, but because we are starting a brand new project uh, called GRAD, which is Global Resistance to Authoritarian Diffusion which is not only a historical problem, as Jean reports really well in her book, but something that is coming back. And Brazil in particular, although in those times it was a, a kind of haven of sorts, I know that it wasn't like all great, but at least you had the opportunity from Brazil to help people in other places which were going through uh, worse uh, phases. Brazil very recently went back alongside many other countries in the world, as you know, uh, I don't have to, to list them here. So there is a resurgence of the kinds of regimes that uh, Jean uh, describes uh, in, in her book in the context of Latin America in the 1970s uh, and 80s. So it's a good reminder that, uh, it's especially through this work of clamor and organizations like that, that we cannot rest. You know, it's an ongoing struggle. And even, uh, and with that I finish in relation to uh, the, the facts that she reports so well in, in her book, there have been two uh, recent developments showing that we are still not, we haven't still closed that chapter and we are still, you are already opening new ones. So last December, uh, the, the Uruguayan kidnap uh, case that she, she reports, they uh, arrested two uh, people who participated in, in, in that uh, episode, and there are legal procedure, proceedings like running now 
against them, but we will see how it ends because it, it can take a long time and not always successfully. And only two days ago, I don't know if you've seen that, Jan, in Brazil, they convicted in first instance someone, uh, 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 an officer of the police during the 80s, uh, who uh, confessed to have disappeared with 12 bodies oh, yes, uh, yes, in, 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 in Brazil. And this is just a first instance uh, decision. It's still going to appeal and take ages. But it's, it reminds me of something that you, 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 you talk about in one of the chapters of your book, which is uh, the theology of the loopholes. Mm -hmm. A theologia dos... Uh, brechas. Das brechas. Das brechas. Because as you know, Brazil has an amnesty law, and it's one of the few countries in Latin America in which the Supreme Court actually uh, confirmed that the amnesty laws were valid, despite the Inter-American Court have, having decided uh, otherwise. So there cannot be any prosecutions in, in Brazil. However, for disappeared people, because it's a non-going crime, occultation of corpses, they can evade the amnesty laws, which are only for a certain period of the military dictatorship, she finished in 1979, if I'm not mistaken, they can still prosecute people for disappearances. But there hasn't yet been a firm final condemnation, conviction of anyone like that. So with my, without further ado, I would like to uh, thank uh, all, all the uh, speakers uh, who, who are here today uh, with, with us. And I will introduce them later. But I think we'll start with uh, Jeanne uh, talking a bit about her great book. Thanks, Jeanne, for, for okay. coming here. Thank you. Good evening. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for coming here because I'm quite sure that some of you would prefer to be lying on the grass in Hyde Park or somewhere. But instead of that, you found your way here to listen to us tonight. And I want to thank the Brazil Institute and the Transnational Law Institute, Dr. Otavio Ferraz, who just spoken, for hosting the event. And I want to thank Brazil Matters which has helped to organize it and publicize it. And I'm also very honored to be here in the presence of two speakers, two fellow speakers, Trisha Fini, who's an old friend of mine, and Dr. Francesca Lesser. They will introduce themselves and explain more than I can who they are and what they've done. Well, most people will never have heard of Clamore which is really why I decided to write this book, to tell a story which is really largely unknown. And I decided also to write it when I realized that few people knew the extent of the atrocities committed in Argentina after the 1976 coup. Everyone knew about Pinochet's coup of 73 in Chile. The brutal overthrow of elected president Salvador Allende sent waves of shock and horror around the world. Solidarity with Chilean exiles was huge. Pinochet's name became a byword for terror. But there was nothing like the same reaction when three years later, the Argentine military overthrew Isabelita Perón, the widow of populist president Juan Perón. Her government was weak and unpopular, and right and left-wing armed groups were active with frequent kidnappings, bombs, assassinations. So the Argentine military learnt from the Chilean experience. They sent out emissaries to Western governments to prepare the ground for their coup. They were advised to avoid the excesses of Chile. And of course, it was the time of the Cold War when, when the Western governments encouraged anti-communist activities and turned a blind eye very often to the, the violations they committed. So they adopted a new method disappearances. Instead of executions, they disappeared with people. They claimed, of course, that their targets were the members of armed left-wing organizations, but these had already been largely defeated. And they also used disinformation, calling the repression a dirty war, although it was in reality state terrorism against unarmed men, women, and children. 
the mothers of the disappeared who began wearing white headscarves and silently protesting in front of the Casa Rosada were dismissed as locas, mad women. For some time, they got away with it, forcibly disappearing anyone they chose. This meant that people were seized in the street, at their work, in the university, and many vanished in the middle of the night from their homes. Doors were broken down and they were dragged away, hooded and handcuffed, never to be seen again. If they had children, these were simply dumped with neighbors or abandoned in the street, sometimes with a telephone number pinned to their clothes. Some very small children disappeared with their parents, as did the many babies born to pregnant women who were seized, tortured, allowed to give birth, and then murdered. The disappeared were taken to secret detention camps located in abandoned buildings or inside military installations. They were held in degrading conditions with little food or water. They were never formally accused or tried. Most were sadistically tortured and very few survived. To eliminate the evidence that they had been held, many were then taken on death flights and thrown out of planes, drugged and alive, into the sea. Others were shot and their bodies were burnt. When families tried to find out what had happened to their husbands, their wives, their sons or daughters, they were told there was no information on them because they had not been officially arrested. They had just disappeared. So thousands of Argentinians fled to Brazil to escape the repression. No passport was needed to cross the border, just ID. So they came by bus, mostly heading for Rio or Sao Paulo. And in 1977, I got to know many of them, mostly young people, families. Many of the children were tra traumatized by what they had seen. And at first, it was hard to believe what they told us. The stories were too awful. But together with another journalist, Sue Bramford, I decided that we had to write about it. We had to try and tell the world what was really happening in Argentina. The Guardian published our story in March 1978. It contained eyewitness accounts of the disappearances, the camps, the savage tortures, the traumatized children. A few days after it was published, I got a letter from a friend at the BBC saying, many people who read your story just don't believe it's true. By then I joined with a small group of people in Sao Paulo who also felt we had to denounce what was happening in Argentina and the other countries of the region. They were now all ruled by right-wing military regimes proclaiming Christian values but practicing terror and torture. So we created Clamor, whose full name actually is the Committee for the Defense of Human Rights in the countries of the Southern Cone. Besides denouncing the disappearances and the secret camps, we also wanted to provide practical help to the refugees finding them somewhere to live, schools for their children, arranging documents. Many had arrived with nothing. I remember, for example, Isabel, a trade union leader who arrived on my doorstep one day with only the clothes she wore, exhausted and desperate because she'd fled when she heard they were looking for her. Or there was a young student called Elida who spent three days hiding in a park in Buenos Aires while friends got her false papers. Or well, there was a young couple who'd got so used to only speaking in whispers because they, for a year they hid in the, in the house of a friend that they still spoke in whispers. They couldn't speak in normal voices. It was a modern day Anne Frank story. And those were the sorts of stories that we heard that made us create Clamor. We were an ecumenical cosmopolitan group there was a Brazilian Presbyterian minister, an American nun, a French-Canadian priest, a Brazilian lawyer who defended political prisoners. And right from the start, we had the enthusiastic support of Cardinal Arns, better known as Dom Paulo, the Archbishop of São Paulo, who was an outspoken defender of human rights and critic of the military regime. And also of the World Council of Churches through Charles Harper, who was the coordinator for Latin America. And we soon established links with both Catholic and Protestant <laughs> churches 
in Europe, in North America, and in South America. And we, and we established links, too, with just about all the human rights organizations, not only in Argentina, but in the other countries of the region. We sent out news bulletins in Spanish, Portuguese, and English, and Clamor quickly became well known. And very soon, letters were flooding in, many of them <clears throat> from families in Argentina and Uruguay denouncing the disappearance of their loved ones. The letters also revealed the traumas of those they left behind. The mother of a young woman wrote, my husband has died of sadness. She had disappeared. My husband has died of sadness, she said. A grandmother of, the, of a four-year-old left behind with her baby sister said, she never stops asking for a mother. I don't know what to tell her. Once we realized how many children had disappeared, either with their parents or after being born in captivity, Clamor decided to make them its priority. And in 1979, through an amazing series of coincidences stretching over five countries and two continents, we were instrumental in finding the first ones to be located, a small brother and sister who had been abandoned in a square, not in Buenos Aires where they lived with their parents, but hundreds of miles away on the other side of the Andes in Valparaiso, Chile. Apparently, this was to stop their families ever finding them but we did find them and they were reunited with their biological family. Over the years, we developed very close links with the grandmothers, Las Abuelas de Plaza de Mayo, who made frequent trips to Sao Paulo, bringing and taking information written on tiny bits of rice paper hidden in boxes of chocolates. The grandmothers reckoned that up to 500 babies and children had been disappeared, either appropriated at birth sometimes by the same men who tortured and killed their parents or abducted as small children. <clears throat> it was only years later that General Jorge Videla and 10 other people, including doctors, were tried and found guilty of what was termed a systematic plan for the stealing of babies during the dictatorship. In 1978, we adopted the slogan, Solidarity Knows No Frontiers, and this was in response to the discovery that the kidnapping in Porto Alegre in southern Brazil of four Uruguayan exiles, uh, Liliane Celibert and her two small children and Universin do Dias, had been a cross-border operation by Brazilian and Uruguayan security forces. In our bulletins, we denounced other cases of cross-border collaboration, most of them involving the capture of members of the Argentine left-wing organization, the Montoneros, in Brazil. Of course, later on, these operations became known as Operation Condor, which was a collaboration between most of the South American countries to, to find and to very often murder or capture exiles from their country who'd found, who were either in exile or were traveling through another country. In 1980, we decided that instead of talking in general terms about the disappeared and banding about numbers, 10,000, 15,000, 30,000, we ought to try and give them an identity, show who they were. So we brought together all the lists of disappeared people which were being produced by different organizations, including Amnesty International, and added as much information as we could find about each person their age, their profession, their nationality, where they disappeared, if they had been seen in a camp by someone who survived. The total came to over 7,900 names, including children. And this list became one of the bases for the work of CONADEP, the commission set up by President Raul Alfonsín after he was elected president in 1983. From 1983 onwards, the dictators fell one by one brought down by corruption, economic disaster, growing protests, and in the case of Argentina, by the fiasco of the Falklands War. Their achievements, what were their achievements? Their achievements were to have eliminated with cruel and savage methods, not just the members of armed guerrilla groups, but a whole generation of idealists, of progressive leaders, of creative minds. 
In 1991, when Pinochet, the last dictator in the region, left power, we decided it was time to close down. For a few very intense years, we'd done as much as we could to help those who resisted the dictators and to find out where, what had happened to the disappeared. But now democracy, however imperfect, had been restored. The years passed, and then a few years ago, I realized that what had happened in the 1970s and 1980s was completely unknown to, a young, to, to younger generations. Young Brazilians had no idea that their country had been home to hundreds of thousands of refugees and exiles from Argentina and, Europe, and Uruguay, and to a small extent, Paraguay and Chile. Or that even though Brazil itself was still ruled by the military, there'd been a huge amount of solidarity, not just from the churches, from trade unions and human rights organizations, but from individuals who opened their homes to the refugees. Nobody knew about the existence of Clamor. In the wider world, while everyone still knew about Pinochet, very few knew the extent of the terror in Argentina. So that's why I decided I had to tell the story of Clamor before it was too late. I interviewed the surviving members who are still alive and the collaborators and members of other human rights organizations in the various other countries, especially the grandmothers, because after all, no one was getting any younger. But to write the history of Clamor, I also had to consult the archive. During its 12 years of existence, Clamor had to build up a huge paper archive of letters, newsletters, bulletins, testimonies, even some death certificates. They filled 106 boxes at SEDIC, the research center of the Catholic University, which very conveniently was just around the corner from my home. But they were all jumbled up together, not even sorted by country. I spent at least two years going through the boxes, reading everything one by one. So my book is a result of that research, an attempt to record the story of Clamor in the words of its members and allies. The Portuguese version, which was published earlier, will hopefully remind younger Brazilians of a forgotten period in their own history. I hope that it will also serve to remember the disappeared who vanished into the secret detention camps, never to be seen again. And it's a tribute to those who never gave up looking for them, their mothers, fathers, and grandparents, and in some cases, their sons and daughters. In Argentina, over 130 babies who were appropriated by the military have been found, as well as the remains of some that disappeared. But most continue disappeared, and they mustn't be forgotten. Thank you. Thank you, Jean, very much. And I think we are all very glad that you decided to write the, the book uh, because it's a really important uh, book to, to register that uh, awful history and to allow people younger than, than us to, to know that, that that took place and that it could happen again. So uh, we have to remain vigilant. So we are going to hear now from Dr. Francesca Lessa. Thank you so much, Francesca, for being here with us today. She is a lecturer in Latin American Studies and Development at the Oxford School of Global and Area Studies. She specializes in human rights in Latin America, focusing on accountability for past and present instances of human rights violations and the politics behind these processes, which encompass state, regional, and international actors, as well as civil society activists. She has uh, published extensively on these topics, uh, and most recently, the book The Condor Trials, Transnational Repression and Human Rights in South America, uh, published by Yale University Press, and winner of the Juan Mendes Prize for Human Rights in Latin America. Congratulations. So over to you. Thank you so much uh, for the kind introduction. And as Jan said, thank you to all of you for being here 
today and taking part in this uh, wonderful uh, book presentation. I want to begin uh, by thanking Professor Octavio Ferraz and also Dr. Uh, De Souza Santos for hosting the event this evening, but mainly to Jan uh, for writing this book and also for inviting me uh, to be a discussant uh, this evening. I should admit that uh, a few weeks ago, when Jan first emailed me, I almost jumped on my office chair seeing an email coming from Jan Rocha in my inbox. For all of us who have worked on human rights in South America, Jan's name is so well regarded and symbolizes the active resistance to the brutal atrocities that South America's dictatorships committed in the 1970s. And so I was of course uh, delighted and deeply honored that Jan would ask me to be a discussant for her book this evening. I heard of Jan and her work with Clamour many years ago, but most recently in 2017, from a lawyer in the city of Porto Alegre. This lawyer was Omar Ferri, and a friend whom Jan had called upon in November 1978 when she was trying to help a couple of Uruguayan refugees, Mario and Hugo, in Sao Paulo, who, were, who had contacted Jan because they were very worried about the well-being of another fellow militant, also in Uruguayan exile, called Lilian Celiberti, alongside her two children, Camillo and Francesca, and her companion, Universindo. All of them were living at the time in Porto Alegre, and Lilian and Universindo were militants of the, par of the Partido por la Victoria del Pueblo, also known as PVP in Spanish, a party that had been founded in July 1975 in Buenos Aires by Uruguayans who lived in exile in Argentina. This party aimed to catalyze resistance against Uruguayan military dictatorship from abroad and promote the return of democracy to their own country. And because of this, hundreds of PVP militants were hunted down between 1976 and 1978, all across the southern cone, in Argentina, in Uruguay, in Brazil, but also in Europe, in France. Reading Jan's book meant reading about stories that were both familiar and novel at the same time. Although I knew well, or, or I thought I knew well, some of these cases that she described in the book, such as the story of Liliane and her family and the disappearance of siblings Anatole and Victoria Julien, Jan's book provided me with some new and fascinating details that I was not aware of, given her first and an intimate knowledge of these cases. Reading Jan's book was also both extremely easy and extremely difficult. It was easy because her book and my own research, in a way, are the two sides of the same store of the same coin. I feel like our books complement each other very well because we tell so many stories relating to Operation Condor in slightly different ways. My account is that of an academic who studied these events with a significant time lag from when they occurred. On the other hand, Jan was a direct player who has personal memories of these events and who had a key role in actively shaping some of these stories, telling them to the world but also helping save the lives of many refugees and their families. At the same time, the pages of Jan's book also are very difficult to read. As Jan herself admitted in the presentation, but also in the book, some of the stories that she heard from the refugees who had finally made it to Brazil, many of them escaping from Argentina, were so brutal and painful that they seemed impossible. The magnitude and extent of the horror that they were narrating was so extensive and unprecedented, even for a region as South America that had a long tradition of military coup 
and political repression. What the refugees were telling Jan her, and her colleagues seemed unthinkable. It couldn't be true. But it was true. And so much of that horror remains to be fully unveiled today. We still do not know the fate of thousands of disappeared across South America. We still do not know where the disappeared children, the living disappeared, are. We still do not know about the level of civilian complicity, especially of businesses and enterprises that benefited from state terror and that supported the existence of the dictatorships from, for many years. And all of these questions deserve answers, answers that still remain pending and that reflect an open wound in many of the societies of the Southern Cone and Brazil. There is so much to say about Jan's book, but in the interest of time, I will focus on uh, five key points and end with three questions for Jan if there is time at the end. So first of all, Jan is what I call in my own research, a justice seeker. I developed this analytical concept of justice seeker to capture the effort of those individuals who in the face of horror and state repression decided not to be overwhelmed by terror, but instead embarked on a perilous journey of trying to register and document the atrocities that were being committed as well as to bring them to the international attention, tirelessly working to achieve accountability. Jan is undoubtedly one of the justice seekers. She did so mainly through her work at Clamor, but also as a journalist who was reporting for The Guardian and for the BBC. Justice seekers have played a fundamental role in undermining the system of impunity and terror from the very moment in which these atrocities were being perpetrated across South America. The fundamental work that Clamor carried out between 1978 and 1991 was absolutely crucial in documenting the extent of what seemed to be unbelievable forms of terror. Secondly, I would like us to reflect on some of the conditions that led to the emergence of Clamor in 1978. As Jan writes in her book, there were two important dynamics in the late 1970s in Brazil. The first is that since 1974, Brazil had been undergoing a process of abertura, and I don't speak Portuguese, so I apologize in advance. <laughs> um, a slow, controlled, top-down and gradual process whereby the Brazilian dictatorship was transforming itself into a democracy. This process would last until 1985. During this time, and compared to the situation in the rest of the region, Brazil seemed a haven of normality and safety, especially when compared to the brutal repression unfolding in Argentina. Despite the continued restrictions that existed, Brazil nonetheless offered the opportunity for many exiles to regroup and resist the dictatorships from there. In parallel to this, and this is the second condition, Brazil had become the principal destination for refugees after the 1976 coup in Argentina, a country in which they had sheltered for a long time. It is noteworthy to see how this movement of people across South America, and in particular the safe haven that Brazil provided at the time, catalyzed the emergence of Clamor and its continued work over the years. The need to tell the stories of the refugees, to denounce, to register the horror that was taking place, to name and shame South America's regimes. This commitment to speak the truth and denounce the crimes was reflected in the very name of the NGO. Jan writes that Clamor's name included LA for Latin America and Amor or Love, Love Your Neighbor, which seemed appropriate. And she also mentions that Jaime Wright, one of Clamor's members, immediately came up with the biblical reference, I heard the clamor of your people, which became Clamor's motto. 
Jan and the other founding members of Clamor were ready to start fighting, not with swords or pistols, but with words. Third, and linked to the point I just made, Clamor also had a second motto, whose emergence uh, reflected the group's effort to try to counter the coordination of terror that had been unfolding at the time through Operation Condor. As uh, Jan also mentioned just now, through Operation Condor, the military regimes of South America had at the time suspended borders in order to facilitate the political persecution of their political opponents, no matter where they were to be found. And so this second motto of Clamor, solidarity knows no frontiers, is particularly fitting. And Jan recalls in the book how the episode of the Porto Alegre kidnapping in 1978 drew the NGO's attention to this reality of cross-border cooperation between the security forces, which had begun several years earlier, but had passed largely unnoticed in Brazil until then. And so encountering this collaboration, Clamor worked tirelessly to denounce the crimes committed in Argentina, in Chile, in Uruguay, Bolivia, and Paraguay. Fourth, Jan narrates in her book the whole set of crimes that haunted South America during the 1970s. But she mostly focuses on disappearances and the disappearance of children in particular. Across the region, there was a similar pattern of crimes that normally began with the abduction of the victims and that was later followed by interrogation under torture in one of thousands of secret prisons that dotted the landscape of South America. A network of sites from police and military units to civilian properties where those imprisoned were deprived of their basic rights as human beings and subject to the worst torments that one can imagine. This strategy of state terror was aimed at its stalling fear in direct victims and their families, but not only them. Society as a whole was the broader target. Terror was so all-reaching and all-encompassing that no one was really safe. Anyone who overstepped the line could end up in the list of the disappeared. And the absence of the bodies of the disappeared also meant that no crime had been committed. And this enabled the military regimes to effectively put in place a campaign of propaganda, misinformation, and denial to hide the truth about what was really happening. Even the children of the disappeared became disappeared themselves, being illegally appropriated and raised by families loyal to the military regimes. In her book, Jan narrates many of these stories, from the first case of the disappeared children being recovered in 1979, to the cases of Carla, Paula, and Mariana in the 1980s and 1990s, who recovered their identities during democratic years. In fact, seeking justice remained a challenge despite the return of democracy to South America. And I also wanted to just briefly, but I don't want to go over time, to mention uh, something that Professor Ferraz has also touched upon, the fact that uh, through the strategic efforts of litigations, and specifically through using the crime of disappearance as an ongoing crime, a crime that continues to take place until the final destiny of the victim can be determined with some certainty, justice seekers have been able to um, break the logic of impunity and the logic of amnesty laws that the military regimes, but also democratic governments, had sanctioned as part of the efforts to prevent any accountability from taking place. And so in the 1990s and the 2000s, uh, we can see the efforts of many lawyers, judges, and prosecutors that pushed ahead this thesis of disappearances as an ongoing crime, and also judges eventually accepting this argument and finally proceeding to carrying out 
some of these uh, criminal investigations. And finally, I also want to touch upon something that Professor Ferraz also mentioned, which is the uh, theology of openings or loopholes, which uh, was an expression coined by Jaime Wright, uh, one of the members of Clamor, and an expression that he used to describe Clamor's unorthodox methodology. The idea behind this theology was that any opportunity, any chance, however unlikely, however unconventional, could be used if it benefited the cause of the people for who Clamor was fighting for. And I found this point of the theology of openings to be extremely interesting because I would argue that this has been one of the defining features of the work of justice seekers like Jan, who have been looking for these loopholes and openings and even creating them when they didn't exist as part of their efforts to seek justice and denounce the crimes. And so I want to conclude by thanking Jan once again for writing this important book and for sharing her personal recollections with a large audience. And if we have time, I'm just gonna leave three questions uh, for you uh, to hopefully answer or also in the reception afterwards. Since you were active in a context of very high risk mobilization, because although there was an opening in Brazil, it was still a time of dictatorship, I would like to ask you what was your biggest challenge or fear at the time that you were active in Clamor? The second point or second question is, um, since Clamor closed in the early 1990s, and if you look back to the region now, how would you say that the region has fared in terms of settling accounts with the violent past? And finally, a question on Brazil. Um, if you think that the failure to properly account for the crime of its own military regimes can help us understand the emergence of politicians such as Jair Bolsonaro, and the nostalgia of the dictatorship that we have seen most recently in the past few years. Thank you very much. <laughs> we'll keep those questions for the Q&A session afterwards. So if you have questions, uh, we'll also have the opportunity to ask them. So we'll move now to Tricia Finney, whose career has been spent on the front lines of human rights and humanitarian work in Latin America and Africa. She has held senior positions uh, and conducted extensive field experiences with Amnesty International, where she investigated the enforced disappearance of thousands of opponents of the Argentine military juntas, and with Oxfam, where she studied the impact of development projects funded by international financial institutions. In 1998, she founded RAID and was its first executive director until retiring in 2017. She developed RAID's work ranging from legal actions against mining companies complicit in war crimes to pressing stock markets for more effective regulation of companies involved in corruption and human rights abuses. Uh, she read modern languages at London University and was wor has worked as a consultant for the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and advised the UK government on corporate governance. Currently, she's a senior advisor at the SAGE Fund that supports innovative campaigns in the global south to strengthen the human rights accountability of powerful economic actors. Thanks, Risha, for coming. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I feel after such amazing um, uh, two speakers uh, who have um, cast such a, a brilliant sort of spotlight on uh, the you know, atrocities that uh, were unfolding across Latin America, but particularly Argentina, Brazil, and Chile, and Uruguay um, in the 70s and 80s, that perhaps a lighter note needs to be struck. <laughs> Uh, one of the things uh, that is a delight in Jan's wonderful book is that somehow there, the humanity of the group and those um, innovative have-a-go techniques that they developed um, led room for, 
for humor. <laughs> and that, even in the darkest, or not quite the darkest moments, but that sort of lightens um, the atmosphere um, considerably. Um, and I, I just, well, I, to introduce myself briefly, I first met Jan uh, when I was a researcher working in Amnesty International. Uh, I was taking over the, uh, the Argentina desk. Uh, Jan was based in Brazil, but I also sort of had a watching brief on Brazil, so it <laughs> meant that I didn't get a lot of work done in those early years. Amnesty at the time was just beginning to get established as a, an international human rights organization. Uh, uh, and so moving away from the traditional pat, uh, pattern of solidarity, single issue campaigns on specific countries. And that was the genius idea of uh, its founder, Peter Benenson. And at the time I started at Amnesty, It, it's a, a, you know, a membership organization, and so you're very much uh, responding and trying to utilize the power of ordinary individuals who are shocked by the kinds of things that Jan and her colleagues were confronting. In, uh, in 1976, we decided at Amnesty that we should try and have a mission to Argentina. We'd been working during the period of Isabel Perón uh, with the AAA, the terrible murders that were going on, uh, and again, there was a lack of accountability for who was allegedly responsible. Uh, when the coup came, as was noted, it wasn't like Pinochet's Chile with Salvador Allende being gunned down in the Moneda Palace, uh, everybody said, oh, it's very quiet, the, the coups happen, but nothing to worry about. <laughs> but almost, well, from day one, the sinister disappearances and kidnappings started to mount up. And during those first two years, uh, I think probably the majority of the 15 to 30,000 people were kidnapped uh, many of them killed, as we now know, but there's a big question mark about what's happened to all of them. Um, so Amnesty decided it would try and use the, the technique it had adopted to go to Chile, uh, when after, shortly after the Pinochet coup, uh, a high-level mission went with an American, a very respected American lawyer, Orville Schell. They managed to get accepted at a, a high level, and they had um, a very conducive, useful visit, even though what they uh, were uncovering was horrific. You'd had the murders in the stadium and so on. Uh, and as a result of that Amnesty report, uh, they were able to set up a UN working group on Chile. And so that was kind of like the model that we had in mind. Um, unfortunately, that was not to be the case. Um, we decided, uh, partly for our own protection, because we knew things were rather extreme in Argentina at that time, it was November 76, that we would go with a congressman from the US, Father Robert Drynan, a Jesuit congressman, which seems I think nowadays it wouldn't be allowed, uh, but he was the dean of the Georgetown Law School, so he had amazing sort of credentials. And then we had Lord Avebury, who um, had a very good, strong track, track record on human rights and had done previous missions for amnesty in, in Sri Lanka and other places. And so that gave a lot of respectability and cover for the amnesty visit, uh, which was negotiated in a quite civilized way with the Argentine uh, representatives here in London. Um, and it was interesting that although the diplomats in London and Washington thought that the mission was sort of being approved, they thought it was a good opportunity for the military 
government to put their case. Uh, when we got there, they'd obviously changed their mind. And so it was, um, uh, they uh, downgraded the status of the mission as a kind of private visit from two members of Congress and the UK House of Lords. I was excluded from all the meetings uh, with the officials, not many of which actually took place. Uh, and we were kind of regarded as fair target for the um, sort of security forces. So obviously trying to intimidate and um, make our lives as unpleasant as possible, which they <laughs> succeeded in doing. Um, I remember events like coming back late one evening to our hotel and being surrounded by a group of thugs in electric blue suits who claimed they were there to protect us. And uh, Drynan, who was quite a, an excitable personality, I mean, a great figure, really, um, started to wrestle with the cameraman with, with, uh, who was among this group because he was taking pictures. And Drynan grabbed his, <laughs> his camera and it really turned very, very ugly. And this was about midnight, and they had the Ford Falcon cars outside. And uh, I've phoned the US Embassy. Uh, luckily, the phone worked. Uh, and uh, they sent a detachment of Marines, <laughs> not for me and Lord Avery. We had to take our chances. But they stood outside uh, Drynan's bedroom all night, um, which seemed a bit OTT, but I suppose it did send a, a message back to the, uh, the junta and the excitable members of the military and, and the kidnap squads that they could only go so far. But when I look back at the, the mission report that came out uh, in March 1977, so a year after the coup, you know, one of the biggest sections is on refugees, on refoulement, uh, and we have the whole beginnings of the Orletti story, which is, again, picked up in Francesca's wonderful book, and the trials that have slowly, you know, worked their way through the system. So in a sense, um, it seems to me that there was a willful blindness that if you read some of the cables, not just the stuff that has been released from the US State Department and uh, other US sources, um, the limited release of um, foreign office files at the time in the UK, some of which have mysteriously disappeared, as um, Grace Livingston and others discovered, um, that you know, there was you know, pretty early on an, uh, an awareness among the diplomats uh, what was happening, but they thought, oh, well, it'll, it'll calm down <laughs> after a while. But it just went on getting worse and worse. And one of the things that most concerned me, I was trying to follow the amnesty rule book. We didn't have a uh, high is rather useful <laughs> you know, motto um, uh, of, you know, we don't threaten anything and uh, we don't bang tables. Drynan went bonkers in some of these meetings uh, and he would pump his fist on the table with these Argentine military in front of him and say, if you don't bring me the um, Monica Mignoni by the 10th of November, I'm going to make sure aid is cut off <laughs> to Argentina. And I thought this went slightly beyond Amnesty's mandate. Um, but it obviously, you know, was not that Monica ever reappeared and sadly was one of the ESMA uh, detainees who was probably thrown into the South Atlantic after a few weeks of torture. Um, but it did shake them up. And uh, I think back to the mistakes that the military made, maybe to accept the mission in the first place, thinking that they could kind of convince, but then this rather schizophrenic attitude, like, well, we're going to make them feel really uncomfortable. It was something they did with future uh, subsequent visits. Um, at the same time, believing you know, in this rhetoric about, you know, a, a war going on and that they were you know, fighting pitched battles and 
and that Videla, we kept on hearing this for years, you know, how Videla was the voice of sanity and he was a good man and give him time and you mustn't rush things. Um, and it was all a very uh, useful blanket and kind of def deflator. I mean, one, one of the many things that I probably got wrong, uh, I remember going early on to see a foreign office official um, uh, in King Charles Street and going up to his offices in, you know, the attic. Um, we were supposed to be talking about Argentina and, the, uh, uh, and he didn't have a map of Argentina, but what he did have was this map of the Malvinas and the Sandwich Islands. And I thought, honestly, can you believe it? <laughs> and yet, as events, I mean, obviously, that was one of their key concerns was not to exacerbate tensions. They were trying to get the leasehold for years, uh, an agreement with the Argentine government, even under the Peronist government. Um, but what we subsequently know is that without the Malvinas de Rota, um, uh, the life of the military hunters might have staggered on a bit longer. So, oddly enough, we have to thank Mrs. Thatcher for <laughs> a return to democracy rather sooner than we expected. Um, I'd just like to uh, not prolong things, just say that Jan's book is incredibly readable, it's engrossing, it's kind of eyewitness uh, account, um, and uh, it's um, one of the things about Clermont is it I think is probably was the first regional global south human rights organizations in the world. <laughs> um, you know, it's, so it was a very innovative from, from the get go. And, um, uh, and they always had this generosity and reci reciprocity, wanting to share the good news and the bad news and, and making alliances so that you know, if, if we were better at amnesty at doing the uh, interventions at the UN level, you know, we could do that. If they, they could run down to Porto Alegre or get lawyers like the wonderful Omar Ferry to kind of knock on the door and ask what was happening at, at the flat of Liliana Celiberti. Uh, so just being on the doorstep was amazingly important. And I, I think of one final thing that, um, Juan Mendes, the great human rights uh, lawyer and academic Argentinian, um, he wrote that from the time of the coup, uh, not a single judge responded to a habeas corpus writ. And yet, if just before that, judges did go to check on whereabouts of prisoners, uh, to see if they were, had been legally arrested, if they were safe, not being tortured. And one says, even though it wouldn't have worked, in every case, some of those who had disappeared might well have been saved. Uh, I'll leave it there. Thank, Thank you. you. So we have time now for uh, questions. I think we have already got three questions from Francesca. So while uh, Jan uh, answers them, if you have any questions, uh, I will take them uh, just after this. Do you want uh, her to remind you of the yeah, questions? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. okay. Let me find them. So the, the first question was about um, the fact that your mobilization in Clamor took place still at a time of high risk. And so I was just curious to know what was your biggest challenge or fear during that, during that time? Shall I just ask yeah, and then I'll ask, ask the other? Time. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, it's true, there still was a dictatorship in Brazil. And although it was at a different stage from the others, as Francesca said, it was beginning Versus of abertura, but I do remember we were afraid. We, uh, people, anyone involved in human rights in Brazil at that time lived in a state of ap apprehension, Tavares, uh, maybe. So you were, you always were slightly afraid that the knock at the door might come or that 
the meeting might be invaded. And then, of course, we were also convinced that our phones were being bugged. So we were very careful about what we said on the phone. We preferred to meet physically. And I suppose I felt that because I was a journalist, I was officially credited, accredited to the foreign ministry as a journalist. It did give me a certain amount of protection when I made these, those trips to Paraguay, to Bolivia, and so on. Um, so, and I, although from the journalistic point of view, of course, I was doing what you weren't meant to do at that time, which was get involved with the story. You were meant to be an objective commentator, and I'm afraid I wasn't that at all. I was heavily involved with everything. Um, so that's how it was. You know, you, you, you were afraid, but you thought you had to do it. Thank you. And the other question I had um, was, if you now look back at the region and the last few decades in which there have been a lot of attempts to come to terms in different ways with the legacy of the past, what would be your assessment of what was achieved and what is still pending? Well, I think it's very patchwork. In some countries, you've sort of moved forward and then moved back. In other countries, it's been a very slow process, like Uruguay, for example, of actually overcoming an amnesty law and, and holding trials. In, in, uh, in Brazil, uh, unfortunately, because the return to democracy was a sort of negotiated return, so on, on the understanding that the military wouldn't be investigated, and they'd taken the trouble to pass an amnesty law in 1979, which gave them total um, freedom from uh, trial or accusation. So, and also perhaps in Brazil too, there is a general culture, unfortunately, of impunity. So it doesn't just apply to the military and all the people involved in crimes during the dictatorship, the torture, the arrests and so on. It also applies to other aspects of Brazilian life people who kill indigenous leaders or peasant leaders. There is a general culture of impunity which, which holds true in really in all spheres of Brazil. So what happened during the dictatorship is no exception. And unfortunately there's no, although we now have um, the government of Lula who is a left winger but has had to again to negotiate his government with the Congress. So there's no immediate prospect that that will change, that the amnesty law will be overturned in the Supreme Court and people will be brought to trial, unfortunately. Thank you. And well, I think you already answered a bit of the third question, which was more specifically on Brazil, whether the fact that there hasn't been a full accounting of the past, and I didn't know about the recent case that Professor Ferris was mentioning, whether that helps us explain why we've seen the rise of politicians like Bolsonaro and this sort of nostalgia of the dictatorship. Yes, I think it has a lot to do with it. I mean, and one of the things that Bolsonaro always did was to deny that there had even been a dictatorship, that he denied there'd been tortured. For Bolsonaro, it was a sort of golden age of Brazil when everything worked and everything was, was fine. Um, and I think that's what um, dictators or, or would-be dictators tend to do. They deny what, what's happened. Um, and of course, as I said, one of the reasons why I wanted to write the book was because I became aware that so many young Brazilians had absolutely no knowledge of what had happened in their own country years before. They don't learn about it at school, not only about what happened in Argentina, but also what happened in Brazil itself. They don't know what happened during the dictatorship. And there is Bolsonaro saying that it was actually fine. It was, it was just a movement. It was OK. So it, I felt it was very important to write this book to show what happened. I wrote this other book, too, actually, <laughs> uh, two years before, which was a selection of my dispatches, my reports to the BBC during the dictatorship, just to show what it was like, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, what it was like, not just in terms of human rights, but also economically, you know, that there was hyperinflation, there was massive unemployment and so on, there was censorship. Um, because it, it just seems to me so important that people understand what happened. Young Brazilians and other young people in other countries understand their recent past. Thank you very much. So, 
Are there any questions? Could you please introduce yourself briefly before you ask the question? Yeah. Uh, I'm Patrick Cunningham. I'm a, a, a trustee of a charity that works with indigenous people, Tribes Alive, but this isn't really anything about indigenous people. Um, it's really perhaps more for Tricia Feeney, um, but it's relevant to all of you. There have been multiple cases of, of uh, obnoxious situations which have been resolved only by uh, a process of reconciliation which usually includes some level of impunity for those who are Im implicated. How um, acceptable do you think that is as a way of resolving those situations? I'm thinking about South, South Africa, I'm thinking about uh, Northern Ireland even, um, as well as the Latin American countries. Well, I'm glad that's an easy one. <laughs> uh, well, I would uh, recommend looking at um, Juan Mendes' uh, book, um, Taking a Stand, where he, he, he went on, um, worked for Human Rights Watch, America's Watch, was, wrote some wonderful analysis of, of the Juntas, the first trial, um, uh, and then became a UN um, a special rapporteur. Uh, and he talks uh, about, I think it depends on the society, <laughs> uh, how much there's a democratic buy-in to uh, the process, how transparent the process is. Um, and you realize, uh, so I don't think there's any prohibition on uh, a society that's been through a terrible trauma to reach some sort of agreement on um, uh, starting over afresh. But I think you, you can say that at one level, but of course for the families and the individual victims, um, as we know from Northern Ireland, and we've got this wonderful program on uh, at the moment. Um, that's a very bitter pill, and it's not one you can necessarily insist that they accept. Uh, and that's what's quite uh, encouraging, that there should be space allowed <laughs> uh, for, and, and so not blanket um, amnesties. Uh, there should be space allowed for that if you can bring the evidence, which is obviously quite a challenge, um, to allow those trials against people, particularly for egregious crimes um, of which we're talking. So I, I, I don't know if this is now Amnesty's line or not, but I'm no longer responsible, so um, <laughs> that's good. But, you know, the transitional justice people have thought a lot about this, and the idea is that for mass atrocities on the scale that we've seen in Argentina, you should not have blanket amnesties. And the South Africa legacy is not totally happy. Um. Yeah, if I can add just one quick point about this. There is a good book, great book by uh, Catherine Seeking mm -hmm. called The Justice Cascade, where she, this is a political scientist from Harvard who compares Latin American uh, dictatorships which did and did not follow the prosecution route to test the hypothesis that many people raise, saying sometimes it's better not to prosecute to achieve peace and reconciliation, but according to her and her data, all the countries that did pursue prosecutions are better off today, and I, and I agree, and Brazil, I think, is the great example of that. Would we ever have someone I disagree a bit with you on this, Jen. I don't think Bolsonaro ever denied. He actually said, yeah, it happened and it should happen even more. Like, we should kill, have killed more people, tortured more people. And that kind of language, I think, you cannot uh, use anymore in Argentina, in Chile, but you can still use it in, in Brazil because they, I think partly because they haven't been prosecuted. Uh, any more questions? Yes, the lady there. Um, I wanted to thank you all initially for giving a very insightful and um, touching talk. 
Um, so my question is a forward-looking one. And um, it was very interesting to learn that Clamore um, had very uh, distinctive elements, such as being international, but also um, harnessing collaboration between different stakeholders, as well as uh, seizing opportunities. So in today's world, where some challenges have been heightened, for example, increased disinformation, as well as the availability of more opportunities, I think we're in a more interconnected world today, to ensure successful justice seeking uh, in terms of various contexts in the world where human rights abuses continue. What would you say is your best advice or what are the key enablers to address those challenges we face today as well as on how to seize those opportunities that are available? Yes, That's a, another, another easy question to answer. <laughs> I feel like it's getting harder and harder. Um, I don't know if I would say best advice, but I, I, what I would say is that I think one of the key elements is this effort of documenting and registering the crime. So exactly what Jan and her colleagues were doing, because uh, maybe in the specific time in which crimes are taking place and also what Trisha was mentioning of Juan saying that none of the judges were acting because in these instances of state terror, the whole institutionality of the state is involved, so there might not be immediate opportunities to improve. But the key work of documenting and reg registering the crimes is extremely important. And just a couple of weeks ago, somebody quoted another very important South American lawyer, just like Juan, but from Chile, Roberto Garreton, who was one of the lawyers of the Vicariate of Solidarity. For 10 years, he filed habeas corpus to the courts even though he knew there would be no point that the judges wouldn't do anything. But he hung on to all of the receipts and all of the papers because when the democracy finally came, they had the whole archive of cases that could be used to prove the extent of the atrocities committed. And so I would say in a similar way, whether through all of the NGOs, whether it's Clamor or the Vicaria, the key task of documenting and registering the evidence uh, is fundamental in denouncing the crimes, but also already gathering the evidence for hopefully future trials that will be taking place in the future. Gentlemen here. Thank you. Tim Gervin, the editor of a Latin American legal publication. Um, Ms. Feeney, you mentioned the failure of the, the judges in particular in Brazil. You've mentioned a positive case in Chile and also in sort of, I think it was 76, there was the group of lawyers who pulled together information and presented it when the OAS were down in Santiago and that brought what was going on further to light. So my question then is for you, Professor Ferraz. What do you see as the role of the judiciary? What do you see as the role of individuals, individual lawyers? And I ask this as we live in a country with a, a home, home secretary who attacks activist lawyers. So this is, this is here and now. It's not 25, 30 years ago in Latin America. Thank you. I, I would rather that some questions were asked like about the, the book as well and not really hard questions like to, to ask, but I'll try to, to, to answer. This is actually part of our project I mentioned in the beginning, GRAD, Global Resistance to Authoritarian Diffusion. And a part of GRAD is LED, we like acronyms, which is lawyers' role in both authoritarian uh, resurgence or uh, increase in authoritarian regimes and on, on resistance. And I think lawyers and judges, and I think your book is really great. There are so many uh, lawyers that are mentioned there, both on the positive and negative side. So when, when I went to law school in Brazil, in the first group to, to be completely under the new constitution after the end of the Brazilian dictatorship in 1985, we were very naive. We thought, oh, with a great constitution now and back to democracy, lawyers and judges together will like, make the country great again, like to cite like an awful <laughs> slogan. And very soon you, you realize that these guys in these positions of powers, including judges, they can actually do the opposite as well. They can stop you, they can be obstacles, and most often they are, because it's a very conservative uh, profession. 
Uh, so that's why we, we have to rely more on journalists, on uh, churches. In some cases, they can also be conservative, conservative but, but progressive. So I think the ideal role of the judge and the lawyer is to fight for democracy, is to fight for human rights. And this is what is written in the Constitution in that remit, but very often they, uh, they don't, don't do that. Any other questions? Yeah, well, one thing, the back there, and then we'll come back to you. Yes. I just, I just to uh, well, can you wait for the mic, because oh, we are yeah. uh, recording this. All right. Thank you. I was just wondering, John, if you could tell us something about the, um, the media, the control of the media in Brazil, and the impact that had on your work, and whether social media has made any difference to that, given that potentially it could help to track people down, maybe. Well, of course, at that time, there was censorship, uh, very strong censorship of the media. And of course, social media didn't exist. But it was interesting that we realized after a while that while this censorship was very heavy, particularly about political events in Brazil, um, there was a certain leeway for news about Latin America. And so we, as Clamor, we called lots of press conferences to denounce what was happening, particular events or some of our successes as well, discovery of children or repression. And we, got, we found that we got more space in the media then. So I mean, I'm thinking, of course, particularly of newspapers because the, at that time, television and radio were even more heavily censored than newspapers. So newspapers, there was a certain... Um, leeway, as I said, they could publish stories about Latin America, about repression in the neighboring countries, stories that they couldn't publish about Brazil itself. And of course, today, the situation is completely different with social media. I mean, it's interesting to think that in those days, the only methods of communication we had with people in the other countries were either on the phone or by letter, or if it was very urgent, by telegram. And the telephone, you always were slightly afraid that it was being bugged. But that's what we had to rely on. So people also traveled a lot because they brought up information, written information, verbal information, because they couldn't send it any other way. But in spite of those difficulties, we, we did manage to communicate with the other um, organizations in all the other countries. And we did make frequent visits exactly for that thing of collecting information, find, going to the source, going down into the countries, talking to people there to, to collect information, bring back reports, bring back written um, files on what was happening. Today, I mean, it's such a different situation today. The social media, as we all know, it has the positive side and the negative side. So it would certainly have helped to have had the internet and the instant communication. On the other hand, we know that it's also a negative force which often can get in the way because of fake news and false information and so on. I have a, a follow-up question, if I may, because I think this is really interesting how you did all that without smartphones, without <laughs> social media. So <laughs> when I read like in your book, like, and another bu bulletin came out or a press mm -hmm. release, how did you manage to get the, the word out there? without tweeting it, without uh, <laughs> putting it on, on Instagram? What was the strategy to get it available to more, more people? We went to the post office and posted it. <laughs> <laughs> so lots of lots of copies sent. Uh, yeah, we had a mimeograph. <laughs> I mean, these are sort of ancient words now. But we mimeographed everything. We put them in envelopes and we sent them by post. Yeah. Great. Uh, do you have another question? Yeah. Uh, please, uh, Not so much another question, but I, I took very seriously the fact that I hadn't addressed you, Jen, and I just wanted to, mm -hmm. to say that thinking about all this, and I had the, the, the pleasure of attending your talk last week, Dr. Les, and one of the subjects we talked about there was silence and the role of silence, and that made me start thinking of Bukigoni's book about the, uh, the situation in Argentina, and in the beginning of that book, he reports that the Argentine... Uh, administration, the Junta had hung a white 
uh, luminescent disc or, or, or with the words silencio in the very heart of Buenos Aires, which everybody passed if they were driving uh, 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 anywhere near the, the, the presidential palace, etc., etc. And I'm sure I'd have more questions after I've read the book, but I just wanted to say that I think that the wonderful thing about your book, all of your work, is that it continues to break down that silence that so many would wish to maintain or just push into the past. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Did you have a question? No. Okay, anyone else? Yes, yes, I Okay, so final question, and then we have drinks in the adjacent room, so... No, yes. no. <laughs> Early on, I think it was you, Dr. Lesser, referred to something you weren't going to talk about, which was complicity, the level of complicity, both internally uh, with business and other institutions. What about international complicity? I mean, I was a journalist in those days, and this wasn't making a lot of headlines, despite Jan's efforts. Do you think that the... America and Europe and whatnot were, were turning a blind eye to it or just didn't know? Well, I'll put the question to Jan, if you like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Jan, did you have trouble selling tales about this to the BBC, for instance? Or were they a, a ready market for your stories? Well, um... It varied, George. I mean, I remember, for example, suggesting that um, David Tyndall should make a documentary about the children, because we were so involved with the question of the children, I suggested that the BBC should make a documentary about the question of the children in Argentina. And he wrote to the then BBC correspondent in Buenos Aires, whose name is Derek Wilson, and to consult him about this. And Derek Wilson wrote back and said he didn't think it was a story. He didn't think it was a story. But we, so it wasn't made. But I mean, it varied. You know, there were people who were interested. We made a film in 1995 about the disappeared in, in Argentina for the program Correspondent. Um, I did radio stories. I mean, I, I was sort of in a difficult position because I, I was a journalist, I was correspondent to the BBC then, uh, and yet I was heavily involved in this human rights organization, which at that time, as you know, you, you weren't really supposed to get involved. You were supposed to be more um, impartial. Um, but I, I did do stories on the radio, and I know I did a lot of stories for Brazilian service as well, and the Latin American service about what was happening, because people told me they'd heard things on the BBC. That in turn, and I remember once I wrote a big story for The Observer about the question of secret camps and so on, and uh, it was commissioned by a certain person there, Bob Del Chiaro, and the night before it was due to be published, there was a sort of night of the long knives at The Observer, and he was sacked, and it never got published. So, you know... It, Well, well, the, uh, I knew diplomats in Brazil. I knew the, you know, the consuls and the ambassador and so on. Um, they were, um, they were always extremely cautious. Um, I remember actually when Ted Rowlands, who was minister for something or other, made a visit to the Falklands and then came up through Brazil, and we asked myself and Sue Bramford asked for an interview with him because we wanted to tell him what was happening, because Vladimir Herzog, a Brazilian journalist who used to work for the BBC, had been killed, had been arrested, and then they, they said it was a suicide, but he was killed. Um, and so we wanted to, we asked for an interview with Ted Rollins to tell him what was happening. And in the end, Sue couldn't go. I went and I told him these things. I gave, we gave him a letter for, Callaghan, Jim Callaghan, who was then Minister of Foreign, foreign Minister or something. Um, but they, 
we saw a reference to this in the files, the National Archive in Kew, uh, and the letter was just, they did nothing about it. It was considered to be two journalists who were actually worried about their own skin telling the foreign minister that, you know, journalists were in danger when the idea was to complain about what was happening to Brazilian journalists. So, and, and the National Archive does show that in the case of Brazil, English diplomats knew what was happening, they knew what was happening, but they deliberately proposed for all sorts of reasons, basically trade. Geisel's visit to London in 1976, for example, not to rock the boat in terms of trade. They kept a low profile. Yeah, I think I was possibly one of the first people to be kettled <laughs> because there were about four Brazilians and a few of us from Amnesty who were trying to demonstrate against Geisel's visit. Um, uh, but uh, it, we didn't get very near. But I, I think um, I read uh, recently, I think it was in Grace Livingston's book, that um, the FCO uh, were trying to persuade the Times to stop writing, uh, printing these uh, uh, rather hostile editorials about what was going on in Argentina and saying there's some hothead in the Times who's <laughs> coming out with this stuff. And so they were doing this sort of like typical British um, soft soap persuasion. But I mean, sometimes on Brazil, uh, they were just enamored of Bob Camps, uh, Roberto Campos, and his selling off, flogging the Amazon, and everybody could get rich quick, um, uh, and the Brazilian miracle. Uh, uh, and so that was the dynamo. It was like, in, you know, unimportant to raise human rights issues. But I think the situation now is even harder, because you did have good, you know, journalists like Jan and others uh, who were prepared to stick their necks out and there was a general consensus I think post World War II feeling that it wasn't on and you had very brave uh, Philippe Labreuveur of Le Monde who did amazing reports from Argentina uh, where he lived he had an Argentinian wife at the time and uh, he was reporting a lot about what was going on under the the hunters I think he eventually had to leave but I feel now it's if it's not one of the if it's not Ukraine uh, there's very little space it gets pushed out we don't read much about other parts of Africa or you know and Latin America disappeared almost entirely um, so I think we're up against a lot, and then you've got all this disinformation. So it's a tough call. Any, any more questions? OK, so b before I finish, I wanted to make a couple of announcements and then say a few words. One is the book is for sale here for a special launch price of 17, 17 pounds 50. 50. I really recommend that uh, you you get it, like there are so many poignant, interesting stories as we heard a bit here. One of them actually, I learned a lot with this book, but uh, one of them I wanted to, to mention like uh, at the closing here, the Mariana story, mm -hmm. uh, in which you had to raise a lot of money to put uh, an ad on Clarín newspaper mm -hmm. with her picture to try and find her. And one of the most uh, generous donors was your friend, Susan Howitch who is uh, a f famous writer of Gothic uh, novels, wow. if I'm not mistaken. And I looked her up today, and I found out that she was also a King's College student. She did law here in the law school. So another serendipity, another interesting you coincidence. Me, well, when I arrived here, here today? Yeah, OK. Great, so get the book to uh, he, uh, read about this and many other stories. The other announcement, there are drinks in the adjacent room so we can carry on chatting and I think all that remains to be done is to thank Jen for not only writing the book but coming here today and the other speakers as well. Thank you.